Welcome to First Rung, a stuff homed podcast brought to you with support from Rosine. I'm reporter and would be homeowner Kylie Klein Nixon, and I'm digging deep into the heady world of buying your first home. In the last episode, we learned how to choose the right house and got to grips with due diligence. In this episode, we're striding into estate agents' offices and auction rooms like we do it for a living. First up, auctioneer Roger Dawson, who's racked up more than 10,000 auctions in his career, gives us a lesson in auction room tactics. You'll see people who try to control the process by slowing down the bids. You'll see other people who want to go hard. Home owner and home editor Colleen O'Hanlon explains why she chooses to negotiate rather than bid. Houses were going for really ridiculous prices and really inflated prices in some cases. And after we get to grips with leases... Real Estate Authority Acting Chief Executive Pera Appleton explains some myriad ways you can buy an Aotearoa NZ, why some ways are more popular than others, and which major centre is obsessed with tenders. So get your bidding finger ready and join me at the auction house before this episode is going, going, gone. But before that, have a listen to this. I'm real estate agent Ben Atwell and this is your insider's guide to house listings. Prime location. This is a common one, said in several different ways, but the meaning is always the same. Bring your bank manager, architect, and personal interior designer with you to the open home because you're going to need them to secure this prime piece of real estate. But at the same time, get out the beluga caviar and get the crew on ice because once completed, it will be well worth it. When I was about 10 years old, my folks took me to my first home auction. Back then, they weren't the carnivalesque events they are today. It was a sombre affair. Everyone was in suits and carrying clipboards. I was bored out of my mind. Larking about, I caught the attention of the auctioneer, whose eagle eye pinned me in place. My heart skipped about 10,000 beats. Oh my god, had I just accidentally bid on a house? Of course, I hadn't. What I didn't know then was that you can't just chuck a bid in willy-nilly at a house auction. In fact, it's a legally binding process you need to register to be involved in. I caught up with a veteran of more than 10,000 auctions, Christchurch auctioneer Roger Dawson, to find out what's so attractive about auctions he's been advocating for them since the 1980s. Well, number one, I thought it was a very exciting way to sell property, and I could see that it was very transparent. Everybody could see what was happening, all the buyers could gather in the one place and watch their competition, whereas in other methods of sale, you tended to be flying blind Right, right. in that an offer might be made, but if there was other competition that wanted to buy it, you would not be told what the other people were paying. Right. So the excitement is one of the sort of traps, isn't it, for a first-time buyer, like getting a carried away at at auction? Yes, but generally speaking, you find, particularly if we're talking first-home buyers, that they will be governed to a large extent by what a bank is prepared to lend them. So it tends not to get carried away quite as much in the excitement at that end of the market, but nonetheless, it still does. For example, today today I did an auction on a property and uh, we got $28,000 above the reserve from a first home buyer because they could see where their competition was going and they just knew that they had to pay a little bit more. That contrasts where at the top end of the market, well-seasoned buyers and people operating perhaps in seven figures, a million and beyond, mm, they, mm. They, could, they could sometimes go two or $300,000 more than what they expected to. So I think on a perspective basis, buyers at the lower end of the market don't need to worry about getting too carried away because clearly <laughs> they, will, they will be bank imposed to a degree. What happens if they do kind of get carried away on the day? This is the thing I've always wondered about auctions that makes me nervous. And you, you know, you've had this number in your head the bank's given you this cap. They said, like, don't go above that. You know what you're supposed to do. And then you get there and that all goes out the window. Number one, first home buyers generally would probably have uh, what I suppose you'd affectionately call a handbrake beside them, i.e. mum and dad or somebody <laughs> who's <laughs> yes, going to say yes. to them, well, look, you know exactly where your limit is. You can't go beyond that. Or if they're a very benevolent mum and dad, they might say, look, We'll help you out. Now, as you said before, in over 10,000 auctions now, I have only ever had two people not settle 
on an auction that they bought. And that's right. p- part of the right. reason why people go to auction is because the law very much favours a vendor when somebody buys at auction. The law has no time for frivolous carry-ons when it comes to an unconditional commitment, whereas if you buy a property with conditions from a buyer's point of view, there is a bit more safety in it in that your lawyer will be working you through any conditions that you've put in, and if there's anything that doesn't line up, those conditions will allow you to withdraw from the contract. You've talked before about advice for first-time auctioners. Could you share a little bit of that advice with us today? What's your sort of key things that first-timers at an auction should be doing? First and foremost, I say to people, do a little bit of research for a start. If you find a property that's going to auction, particularly if you've got a couple of weeks until your scheduled auction date, attend some other auctions and watch how they unfold in front of you so you get an idea of the pace of them, uh, what size bids that people place in, You'll see people who try to control the process by slowing down the bids. You'll see other people who want to go hard and big, bid in big chunks in an endeavour to throw people off the property. So that it's quite a tactical game and it pays to educate yourself on how the tactics might unfold. Right. So can you talk a little bit more about this strategy? I know it's almost a bit like you, you go in there to sort of play mind games with your fellow bidders a little bit. <laughs> what, what are some good tactics? There's two types of people really, I guess, who attend. Some people who get in early and they, they just want to say, right, well, I'm just going to impose myself on this auction. Every time somebody bids, <laughs> they, they bid back quickly over the top. If the auctioneer is calling for $10,000 bids and you've got plenty of room in the tank, you might throw a 20 on top because that can unsettle the other buyer's And another good tactic that we see used a little bit is you place your your $10,000 bid and then you say, oh, no, I'll go another five on top of that. So bidding on top of yourself is often another way in which people sitting perhaps a few rows away from you think, well, this person's got plenty of money. They've got an unlimited budget, I think. I might as well give up. So you can play that type of a mind game. Oh, wow. The (laughs) second aspect is is you you get the sort of bidder who will actually just sit there and do absolutely nothing. They sit and they watch and they let one or two or three others fight it out. And as happened at one of my auctions last week, I announced that we were going to sell the property. Uh, Somebody bid another 5,000, somebody bid another 2,000, and then the last bidder absolutely stopped. So I'm sitting there with the figure. The $2,000 bidder's just gone, yes, the two. Thinks they've got it. The auctioneer goes going, going, and then bang, Before the third going gone comes out, somebody threw $1,000 on top. It was the only bid that they they placed all day, but they won the auction with a $1,000 bid. So that's another tactic that people will often try as well. Yeah, I can see why it's exciting. I can hear it. Yes. Tell us a story about one of the like most exciting ones you've ever been at. Well, you mentioned a story once to us before about the fifty dollar increments yes, that went on for two hundred and forty bids, so, or something. something like that. Yes, it was. It was a property in Miravale in Christchurch, and it was in the nineteen nineties. It was always a valuable location. It was ahead of the rest of most of Christchurch, but at the time, the sale price was somewhere we thought around about three hundred thousand dollars. Everybody agreed that would be a good price. Mm. When the bidding got to three hundred and three thousand dollars, the owner was very excited, and the agent just turned to them and gave them a thumbs up, and they said, "Yes, sell the property." So I announced to you, are, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the owner's instructions. We sell today. Well, at that point, there were still three bidders in it. They were still competing, but they went from 303000 to $315,200 in $50 increments. <laughs> and as you said, if you, if you add them up, that's 244 I'm reliably told. So it was very, very entertaining as the people called out, I'm buying the property. No, you're not. It's my property. You might as well give up. I've bought it. And it was very, very funny for the onlookers. So what you advise is getting in there, getting yourself some information, getting yourself some experience of auctions and getting a feel for the environment and then having a go yourself and once you've done yourself. all your groundwork. Yep, yep. These days, uh, if you know which company you're working with, you can do a little bit of uh, research on uh, Google and find out who the auctioneer might be. And many of us 
have our own websites where we give, for example, on my one, I, I've got four different videos, one of which includes how to bid at auction and how to bid with confidence at auction. So it's often good to just have a right. look at the tutorials that auctioneers might have out there as well. Right, that can definitely help you. Mm. So one thing I wanted to ask about, one thing that I've heard mentioned a couple of times, but I don't really understand, and I wonder if you could help me out with it, is vendor bids. Oh, yes, yes. Can you explain that process? Because that was something I... When I first heard it, I thought, well, that doesn't sound very fair. Okay. But it's something you need to be kind of aware of, I think. Indeed. It's very common. Outside the auction room, if a buyer puts in an offer below the asking price, the seller can make a counteroffer, and the agent will work with both parties to see if they can agree on a price. In the auction room, the owner's rights are still exactly the same, except in this case, they don't have the luxury of being able to write up an offer and send it back. The auctioneer simply says, well, sir, your bid is at 50, I'll place a vendor bid at 60, and that's effectively the counter offer. The auctioneer must say the word vendor bid so that the buyer or buyers in the room right. understand. And if I take you back to where you said before, where sometimes you thought, well, the vendor bid, that might be a bit unfair. But if a property's worth a hypothetical 100 and a buyer puts in a bid of 50 and he says, well, I'm the market today... In fact, he's not. He's a bargain hunter, and you can't blame people for looking for a right. bargain. But the law is simply mm. recognising that the owner doesn't have to accept that figure, and he is open to negotiate, and that's what the auctioneer does with the vendor bid. So say you've got you've got a first-time buyer, and they come to you and say, look, should I be going for this house at auction, or is that going to be just too much for me the first time? Should I just wait for my next step up the ladder to try my hand at auctions? I would say right about now, about a third of our sales at auction, in the auction room, are to first home buyers. And the other thing I would say to a first home buyer, often there is only one buyer for a property and they may end up buying it for less than they might have wanted to pay. And an owner always has the right to adjust the reserve price on the day when they see where the bidding gets to. And again, they might well be in a position where their expectations were a bit lofty. They see that they've got a nice, clean, tidy cash sale in the room on the day and they say yes I know I wanted a hundred thousand but for this young couple in particular and to get me moved on I'm prepared to accept 95. Right I see right so it's kind of got some flexibility mm -hmm. built into it. Absolutely no question about it. I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about the difference between the types of sales so you've got an auction, there's negotiation, there's deadline, buyer inquiries over. There's tender. Tender. And I understand that auctions are more popular in Auckland and tenders are more popular in Wellington. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know what's more popular in Christchurch, I understand it's auctions as well. The two principal ways are pricing, in other words, you just put an asking price on it and wait, or auction. And in one or two select little areas, you will get tender. And as you say, Wellington is the hotbed of tenders. I've never understood why, because we've done lots of research on them, and tender or deadline sale or price by negotiation are all basically tenders, and they all involve secrecy. You write up an offer, you've got no idea what anybody else is prepared to pay, and yes, there are exceptions that very occasionally you might get a tender that is just so beyond your expectations, you say, wow. Roger says that over the last 10 years, he's carried out two surveys, each checking two months' worth of listings that went through by all the different sales methods. He found auctions had a 63% and a 68% unconditional clearance rate. Every other method had between a 6 and 10% unconditional clearance rate in the same time frame. Let's be fair, auctions primarily favour owners because they are getting an unconditional sale, but they favour purchasers from the point of view that they know that they're dealing with a serious owner, which is why they've gone to auction, and secondly, they can decide on the spot whether they want to increase their offer or not, right. and no other system allows them to do that. <laughs> comes time to put your mark on your first home, check out Resine for the professional advice you need for your decorating projects. After talking to Roger, I reckon I'll head along to an auction this weekend, just for a bit of a laugh. Auctions do sound like fun, but they're also shrewd business sense for sellers keen to prize every last penny out of buyers' pockets. 
Unfortunately, for a lot of first-time buyers, the cap on their spending is screwed on pretty tight. Well, one seasoned property owner, home editor Colleen O'Hanlon, reckons she's got a solid tip for saving valuable dollars when shopping for that first home. After the Christchurch earthquakes, she and her then-husband decided to move to the UK. They sold up and bought some land, the idea being that they'd build when they came back. When we did come back a couple of years later, I had an extra baby and the land was kind of on the outskirts of Christchurch and I just didn't want to be stuck at home with three kids, Mm, mm. you know, in the middle of nowhere, really far away from my whanau. So um, Mm. we sold the land and bought this house. When you bought the house that you're in now, Mm -hmm. you made a conscious decision not to look at properties that were for auction. Yes, exactly that. So why why was that? Uh, I think... You know, my husband at the time was English and he had quite a different view on how, how homes should be bought and sold. Although they can be very competitive there, as a buyer, it's much easier to gauge the market. A house has a price tag on it and you kind of negotiate mm. around that. At that time when we returned to Christchurch, it was that kind of post-earthquake boom and houses were going for really ridiculous prices and really inflated prices in some cases mm. uh, at auction. And I think we just felt that life is stressful enough and we just didn't want to put ourselves in that position where we might feel compelled to pay more for a property than we had actually anticipated or wanted to. And that we just eliminate that as a stressful factor for ourselves, even though we knew that meant we would have a lot fewer options in terms of houses for sale. Right. So what kind of prices are we talking about now? How much did you guys have to spend at that time? At that time, we, I think we spent... 5.30 5.30 on this house and it was, you know, well within the limits of our affordability but it was, again for us, that was kind of an active decision because we felt that there was no telling what would happen in the market. Then people were paying huge sums and we had that kind of residual fear that that, that could correct and that, you know, you, what we might pay a lot for today might not be worth that tomorrow. So we kind of took a view that we'd go very middle to low end of our budget and buy something that was mm. really comfortably affordable that we wouldn't have a huge mortgage on so that would reduce right. our exposure, I guess, to being in that position. Mm. Sit it out and wait mm. for a while was the um, strategy. There's sort of not something that first-time buyers would be able to do necessarily. They wouldn't have that kind of flexibility, I guess. No, I think probably for me it was just... You know, in the market, you can feel as a buyer sometimes a bit disempowered, like the odds are stacked against you. Mm. This was just a decision we made to kind of reclaim some of that purchasing power. We just wanted to avoid a situation where we felt we were in a room and things were quite hot and competitive. We're both Mm. quite competitive people, and I would see it as being totally realistic that we could get quite carried away just to win the auction. And we just wanted Mm. to, Mm. from a financial point of view, we certainly didn't buy a dream home but we felt content that we had struck a good deal when we did buy it. Actually, that's an interesting point, isn't it? That contentment Mm. is something people talk a lot about. You're not looking for a dream, you're looking for contentment. And Mm. that that would apply to any house buyer, wouldn't it? Yeah, I I mean, our priorities were, you know, we had a growing family, so Mm. we wanted a house that would be big enough to stay in for a period of time after years of moving around post-quakes, including overseas and back again. Mm. We knew we wanted four bedrooms, we knew we wanted a garden, we had so much stuff, we knew we needed a garage. So, you know, it didn't Mm. really narrow things down. We were prepared to take on a house that needed work doing, Um, and I Mm. think we were really fortunate to find a house that ticked all our boxes and, you know, hadn't really suffered in the quakes and had really only required a bit of a cosmetic overhaul Mm. or, sorry, cosmetic Mm. repairs. And then it really just meant we had to make it nicer for us rather than Mm. fix any big problems that might have existed. You quite often talk to us about the affordability of Christchurch. Mm. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. A little bit? I mean... Don't go tell anybody. I'll just say that... I think I sometimes, um, when I look at my own situation now and I think I'm a single parent household now and I'm in the process of buying this house out from my right. ex-husband. So you're sort of first time buyer 2.0 in a way, yeah. Yes, it'll be the first time, <laughs> even though we've co-owned houses, it'll be the first time I've done it myself. And, you know, I have big feelings for people who are out there in the market doing it for the first time because even though I know what to expect, it's still quite a big leap to put my name beside that much debt, I suppose. Mm, mm. But, I mean, I I think Christchurch, one of my colleagues in Christchurch newsroom has remarked, you know, we're in a newsroom filled with young couples who have been able to afford to buy their own home 
in an okay part of town in an easy driving distance to the city. Mm. And I don't know that that's something you can find in either Auckland or Wellington and, you know, maybe no, maybe not no. even in, you know, Dunedin for that long. So I kind of feel, you know, if you're somebody on a, a nationalised income, a nurse or a teacher perhaps, that what you will get for your income or what you can potentially get for your income in Christchurch compared to Auckland, you know, it's it's the difference of a, a life-changing amount of debt that you're avoiding. Yeah, it's significant. I was just looking at median prices the other day and that, there is a big gap between mm. those main centres. Mm. I do think first-time buyers in Christchurch, the options seem to be different. So the quarter-acre dream, I think, really is dead in Auckland, dead and buried and mourned mm. over for a long time. But here I think, you know, if you're a couple and, you know, you've had some KiwiSaver savings underway for a period of time, that kind of buying a little three-bedroom weatherboard house on a section is still actually a realistic achievement in a way that, um, you know, in some of our other housing markets it just isn't. Christchurch City Council should put you on their payroll. (laughs) Well, it wouldn't be the first time I've convinced somebody to move here for a better option, that's for sure. (laughs) Your insider's guide to house listings. With potential. Get your tool belt and hard hats out. This one might mean you've got some work to do. The word here is potential, and that's something that has to be unlocked, usually through renovations and refurbishment. Remember when viewing to look past the layout, shabby decor, and chipped paint. You're definitely, though, going to have to pack a bit of money into this property to realize that potential. But when you do, it will likely increase the value of your property hugely. Remember in the last episode when I mentioned leases and cross leases? Well, here's my colleague Caleb with the skinny on home ownership types in New Zealand. Kia ora. You might not know this, but there's more than one way to own a property in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Let's take a look. First up, freehold or fee simple, the most common kind of ownership. It means you own the land and everything on it. Leasehold. This means you have the exclusive right to use the property, but will have to pay rent for the land it's on. Then there's a cross lease, which means you have more than one interest in the property, a share of the freehold land and a lease of a specific unit or section. Finally, there's a unit title. Most common in apartment buildings and flats, it puts you on the body corp of your building and gives you a say in how it's maintained and run. You might have to pay an annual levy to it too. This is just an overview of home ownership in New Zealand. For more detailed information, make sure to ask your estate agent or check in with the government's independent property guide, Settled. Even though auctions may seem to dominate property sales these days, there are many ways homes are offered for sale in Aotearoa NZ. I caught up with Pera Appleton, Acting Chief Executive of the Real Estate Authority, a government agency that provides independent information for property buyers and sellers through the website settled.govt.nz. Pera, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Nice to be here. One of the things I notice when I look through property listings is the profusion of different ways to buy a home. So let's do the list. There's auctions, tender, negotiation, deadline treaty, buyer inquiry over, and then you might have multi-offers and mortgagee sales. So why are there so many different ways to, to buy homes or sell homes, I guess? It really reflects the preferred process of the vendor um, and what can work best for the parties. Pera says it's really up to the vendor to decide what kind of sale they want and why. There does seem to be a regional preference though. In Auckland, it's the theatre of the auction room. In Wellington, more opaque sales are the order of the day. Auctions are a fast-paced public sale, um, and so that means the property is sold to the buyer with the highest bid after the seller's reserve price is reached. Right, so, so before you even register, you should talk to your lawyer about what you... Right. And also have all of the available information about that property before stepping into that auction room. You might include a clause about the sale depending on the outcome of building reports or independent valuations. Pera says these days the Law Society even encourages clauses that cover shifts in COVID-19 alert levels. 
so if they change suddenly in your region, you won't have to miss out. In any event, it pays to remember that. If you win an auction, you're committed to purchase that property and so you have to pay the purchase deposit on the auction day and that's really important to remember as well. Tenders are one that I think people are a bit confused about. Yeah, so tenders are quite different to that auction process where you have the auction as quite an open, fast-paced environment. A tender is where the buyer will provide confidential written offers to the agent before a specified end date. And those tenders are um, popular, as I said, in places like Wellington. So why would you want that confidentiality, do you think? I couldn't say why a vendor would choose to approach their sale using a tender specifically. It is really an opportunity for the vendor to have everything available to them at once. So then we've got negotiation and deadline treaty. What do they mean? So there are deadline sales by negotiation and advertised price sales, and those are also um, really common around New Zealand for selling properties. And they are really about providing an offer that then may um, be considered by the vendor. But what's really important to bear in mind when you enter that method of sale is that the vendor can receive more than one offer and then it becomes a multi-offer process. So can you briefly talk through what what, what does a multi-offer situation mean? The multi-offer situation is, as it um, suggests, that there's more than one offer for the vendor to consider. So when you're the buyer putting forward an offer, um, and it might go into a multi-offer situation, it's really important that the buyer puts their best foot forward because it's really, really hard to guess what kind of offer will suit the seller's particular circumstances. Have a think about what are the conditions or circumstances you can put forward or not put forward to remove any barriers for a swift and easy sale. So are you talking about clauses? Yeah, that's right. The clauses or conditions that are placed on a sale and purchase agreement as part of their offer. Could you talk us through what those mean? Like, I've heard that it's better to have as, as few clauses and as few conditions as possible because it might put you ahead of someone who's maybe offering the same amount as you with a few more clauses. So, so the clauses can include things like finance clause. That means the offer is subject to you getting a loan pre-approval from your bank. Sometimes it isn't just the highest offer that wins in a multi-offer situation because from a vendor's perspective it may be, as you refer to, that they, they want an offer that has really limited conditions and it makes it easier for them to move quickly through that sale process. Pera says there's not a huge difference in cost between the different kinds of sales. The REA encourages everyone to get all the checks, reports and info they need before making an offer, whatever type of sale they're undertaking. It's worth it to know what you're walking into. And if you are thinking of avoiding auctions because you don't want to shell out for building reports only to lose to a higher bidder, Pera had this to say. We wouldn't recommend ignoring a particular type of sale. I think what... I was really wanting to emphasise that it doesn't really matter what mode of sale you're entering into. Putting that time and investment in talking with the lawyer, perhaps having a property inspection completed before you make the offer, those are all prudent steps that we would recommend for any type of um, sale. It is just important that you're well prepared as the first home buyer before you make that offer. To me, it sounds like the odds are stacked against first-timers a little bit. Do you think that's the case, or or is that just my pessimistic view? I guess it is a pessimistic view. I don't think it is stacked against a first-home buyer. Those are um, issues and considerations that we would ask or encourage all buyers to undertake. Really, the primary point is to make sure that you're well-informed, and I think it's to the benefit of everyone involved if you ask the right questions, have the right information, well ahead of making such a significant investment, you know, one of the biggest transactions people will make in their lives. The builders' reports and valuations are in and we're registered to bid. You can almost feel that first rung in your hot little hand. Join me in the next episode when we'll learn how to choose a lawyer, what happens when the sun sets on a purchase contract, and how difficult it really is to buy an apartment. I'm Kylie Klein-Nixon and this is First Rung. Huge thanks to our guests Harcourt's auctioneer Roger Dawson, Home Editor Colleen O'Hanlon and Real Estate Authority Chief Executive Pera Appleton. Shout out to producer Joe Hayward and Stuff Podcast Director Adam Dudding. Thanks also to our sponsors Rosine, 
New Zealand Made Paints for New Zealand Made Homes. You can find First Rung on all the podcast platforms. And if you want to get in touch with me, drop us a line at homedatstuff.co.nz. Happy house hunting!